You are listening to Parliament Matters, a Hansard Society production supported by the Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust. Learn more at hansardsociety.org.uk slash pm. Welcome to Parliament Matters, the podcast about the institution at the heart of our democracy, Parliament itself. I'm Ruth Fox. And I'm Mark Darcy. And in this special edition of the pod, we're talking to Rob Burley, one of the legends of political television in the last few decades in this country. He's worked with all the great interviewers, Andrew Marr, Beth Rigby, Emily Maitlis, Andrew Neil. And he's got some stories to tell in his new book, Why Is This Lying Bastard Lying to Me? You might say it's a history of the political interview. You might say it traces the decline and fall of the political interview. And we'll be talking to him about his adventures behind the camera, producing some of the great interviews of our time with our rulers, and looking ahead to what might happen at the next general election. And we started with an account of the famous incident in the last general election, where Boris Johnson ducked out of the opportunity to face Andrew Neil for a long forensic interview. It's true that everybody, all the party leaders were engaging with the BBC about taking part in the programme. It never works in such a way that you line everybody up and they're all signed up, and then and you establish the order in which, which they're all, the, the programmes will happen, and it's all neat and tidy like that. In the course of an election campaign, there are all sorts of considerations, you know, principally logistical ones that usually get in the way. But generally speaking, well, in fact, on every other occasion before that uh, election, despite those challenges, despite even in reluctance there might have been by anybody to do these things, there was a kind of acceptance, a kind of norm that was adhered to, that one way or another you would do it. And so they would fall into place. So, so we proceeded in the same way. So there were conversations with the parties, you know, the Johnson team, the Corbyn team, etc. And then we would, we would slot them in. So Corbyn, uh, you know, fairly early, came along and said, yes, I'll do this date, a particular date. And so we said, right, we'll, we'll do that. And, and that, was, that was recorded. And at that time, the, the message coming from Number 10 was, or from the Conservative Party, was that, that Johnson would do what he had indicated he would do, which would be, as everyone else had always done, he would come along and do it because it's the you know the fair thing to do and the right thing to do, but we were dealing with a different sort of beast here than the the ones we'd had in the past. And uh, you know people say, well, you should have been you're naive if you thought that Boris Johnson would adhere to democratic norms. I don't really think we have much choice but to sort of work on the basis that they would, because you know, like I said, there'd been reluctance by others in the past. But in the end, it, you know, honour, duty, you know, fairness, democracy, these were things that mattered something to people, but. In the case of you know the Johnson team, it was really just about stringing us along for as long as they needed to. to were, were they sitting there consciously saying, we do not really want to do this interview, no. there's nothing in it for us, we're going to dodge it if we can, we're, we're just, as you say, going to string you along Were they saying while. that? You don't have to rely upon my recollection of this, because it's very clear. At the front of the book, I quote, uh, and I don't know if this is a non or a sweary or non-sweary programme. We so. can get away with a few bad words. <laughs> OK, well, I'm going to go for it then. Um, this, so this, is, this was in, in, in 2021 after he'd left Downing Street, but Do- Dominic Cummings uh, tweeted, as he does, Why the f*** would we put a gaff machine, clueless about policy and government, up to be grilled for ages? This is not a hard decision. This was in relation specifically... To the Andrew Neil question, and the gaff machine in question was one was Boris, Boris Johnson. Johnson. So, so that, so in other words, it, there was not a sort of weighing up of oh, you know, shall we or shan't we? It was clear that from the very bit, the, the very outset, that Dominic Cummings, who was in charge of this, and as he said his, himself, that was never a hard decision. They already had decided they would do what they needed, not only to sort of avoid it, string as long to avoid it, but crucially to make sure that Jeremy Corbyn had been through the process because there was the the, the you know, possibility, as played out, that he would be damaged by the interview that he did. With Andrew Neil, so there's n- absolutely no question. Andrew Neil did not conduct that interview with Jeremy Corbyn on the basis of knowledge that Johnson wouldn't do it. Absolutely not. We, were, if we'd known they wouldn't do it, if they'd said that in terms, we would not have been able to proceed with the program. But we were never told that. So you wouldn't have interviewed Jeremy Corbyn if you'd known that Johnson wouldn't do it. Yes, because La- of course Labour were asking what was the status of the Boris Johnson interview. Now. You'll see in the book, and I, I do. Go, I mean, it's maybe. A, I hope I don't lose the reader because it's a bit becomes a bit detailed and inside Westminster or inside media. But it turns out, I in a way, I was I was un, unaware of some conversations that were going on with Labour by some BBC executives that were different. You know, well, that wasn't me. Which, according to Labour, were unequivocal about Johnson having kind of. I think almost the suggestion he may have set a date was kind of indicated at some point according to according to Labour's perception of it. Which I was surprised by, because what what I said to Labour was that we're talking to the Conservative Party, we're talking to Lee Kane, and we're talking to Dominic Cummings, 
about this thing happening. We, we've been told that they will do it when they can do it. They're still yet to set a date, but that is the status of it. And on that basis, are you happy to go forward? And they felt reassured by, I think, other conversations than the one I just outlined that I had. That it, was, it was perhaps a more firm thing than it was. And they went ahead on that basis. Yeah, I think that's a, a very messy mm. example of the kind of things that can go wrong with this process of trying to line up big interviews. But let's rewind a bit, because you've written this book, Why Is This Lying Bastard Lying to Me?, which is essentially a history of the political interview, possibly the decline and fall Mm -hmm. of the big political interview, the good old days when politicians would sit down for half an hour or 40 minutes Mm -hmm. with the likes of Brian Waldron Mm -hmm. or Jeremy Baxman or whoever, and be grilled in vast detail about what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And those interviews were once a vast part of the kind of political media sphere Mm -hmm. and hardly exist anymore in anything like the same form. Why are those interviews, in your view, and you've work for all the greats in this, as I said. Why are they important? Well, they're important because they're an opportunity to have a really detailed, significant conversation about the policy of the the, the interviewee. So that may be the government, a government minister. It may be the opposition. It's an opportunity to really not just get them to repeat some lines, which is what they like to do now, because you can't do that over the course of a, a sustained period of time, 30 minutes or 40 minutes, but actually engage with the interview so you can test a policy. And you don't go in with a sort of the attitude I think some presenters have, um, which is we've got to make an impact with a kind of a headline or something, fireworks or pyrotechnics. It's, it's more of a, look, we've got time. We'll grant you this point. You know, this, 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 this policy you're pursuing is working here. But let's look at this other bit here, which suggests that the evidence is that it isn't working. So how can you explain that? It's just a better way of doing it. And I'm afraid at a time when we need it more than ever, it's, it's almost disappeared altogether. All we have now on a Sunday is... And this is no criticism of the people that are doing it, but we have a sort of a culture whereby they're shorter interviews, they're sort of maybe six minutes or seven minutes, some of them. Some of them are longer on Laura, Laura Koonsberg's show and on Sky, but um, essentially it's a more trivial exercise now because the participants don't want to do very much at all. This is, in your view, and you say it in the book, much better than what you get in Parliament. Most of the time in Parliament, when MPs quiz ministers about their policies, you don't get anything like the level of depth and detail that you get in some of these long-form interviews. Absolutely. I mean, the key to that is is supplementary. I mean, it's, it's very easy to come up with a list of questions that are challenging to whoever the interview is. The key is where you then go to, if it's just their top line and, and, and you can't really engage with it then it's not really a a, a valuable exercise i mean i think obviously select committees is a different question and i think you know there's been some moments we've seen where select committees have delivered that and actually that would be for me a much more productive way for the for parliament to kind of proceed and those are the things we should we should emphasize rather than the sort of essential pantomime and and pointlessness of what goes on in the main chamber of the three of us i'm not part of the media sphere and i i don't sort of see the you know these inside sort of discussions and the 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 technicalities that are involved in putting these kinds of programs together but just talk me through what the mechanics of it are if you are somebody like you know you're prepping andrew ma or you're prepping andrew neil i mean how much time and effort and resources involved in preparing andrew neil to interview jeremy corbyn or boris johnson if you could get him get him in front of him a considerable amount of time and and person hours as it were it obviously depends to some extent on the interviewer andrew neil does not need briefing by you because he's already briefed There'll be nothing you can tell him he doesn't already know. He's, he's already done his own research. But he just he will be consuming data, he'll be consuming everything all the time. So then it becomes then a really much more of a process about the questions, how the interview itself will, will be constructed. Like I say, you know, you can come up with your difficult questions, but how you then work out how you cope with their answers. So it's if they say this, you yes. then ask that. Indeed. So so just to give a bit of history on this, but it's uh, <laughs> I, 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 I go back to Brian Walden again. So... Yeah. The London Weekend Television kind of tradition that came out of Weekend World led to this extra. And I've seen these documents; they're, they're, they're genuine. I'm now using my hands; they are this thick, so you can imagine I'm saying they're very thick set of documents. An interview plan which would say something like, "If you know, the first question would be asked. If they answer A, go to page 16C. You know, that kind of thing. So that it would allow him to walk down every alleyway that can potentially be part of what happens on in reality. And he did actually, apparently, according to you know his editors and people who work with him, he, they felt he probably had some kind of photographic memory if, if, if such mm. a thing exists. Mm. And, and he did have that. So he was able to reconstruct it in his head 
He may have had an aid memoir of some kind, but it was essentially inside his head about where he was going to go. So that's, that's extreme, but that would take a lot of work. It was constructed by the team, you know, a lot of work over the course of the week. I did the successor show of that, the, the Dimbleby show on ITV. And we, you know, it was, it was similar in the sense that we had a week preparing maybe more. We might have a researcher, we might say two weeks time, we've got the education secretary. So, you know, he or she has got themselves and all those civil servants and advisors who all do this every day. They live and breathe this. You need to get to a position where when you sit down with Jonathan, you know as much about it as they might, uh, which is quite a tall order. But that, that was kind of what you were aiming to do. So that would take a long time. But like I say, with Andrew Neil, it might be very much about just about the strategy of the interview more. With others, it might be more about the briefing, but you sort of, it's horses for courses, really. Is the issue here that the big broadcasters don't really have the resources to do this anymore, that the research level involved in creating those interviews is, is just too much for them to easily afford, especially when the viewing figures are often quite derisory? The programmes may be influential, but not all that many people are actually watching them. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't accept the, the, the last point necessarily. I mean, the, the last time the BBC did this was the Andrew Neil show in the evening. The reason it happened was because this is how, you know, this, this suggests it might be not so much a kind of, well, we've weighed up the, the resourcing and we've thought about the viewing figures. It might just be more that they haven't, they don't really think about these things. But when we did an interview famously with, with Andrew Neil and Boris Johnson in the Tory leadership contest in 2019, where he came unstuck on the GATT treaty because he, um, he, he'd gone in very much like someone in a seminar who'd mastered 5B, but 5C was a, a different world to him. That moment delivered sort of such a powerful example of how this kind of thing works that the Director General at the time, Tony Hall, contacted Andrew then and said, we must have a show. We're, like, <laughs> we're, we're all like, you're acting our shows, but, um, you know, OK, let's have a show. Great. So we, we launched a show um, the year before COVID hit. Uh, which was an evening show on a Wednesday, committing itself to doing interviews for a decent amount of time with um, politicians. And, you know, Keir Starmer was on there when he was running for the leadership. It's sort of there as a bit of a set text on what he was saying then after, under, under pressure, which is quite relevant to how you may judge him now in terms of where he is. So these are they're important things. But here's the other thing. It was getting 700,000 viewers. So even on its own terms, compared to Channel 4 News, say, that way it was winning its slot most of the time. And sorry, if the BBC, if the BBC are worried about the viewing figures at seven o'clock on a Wednesday in that they might be able to get a few hundred thousand more or something by having a, a factual entertainment program up against ITV or whatever. If that's their priority, and it was, as it turns out, because the program was axed at the first opportunity, that's wrong because they're a public service broadcaster who should provide things the market doesn't provide necessarily. It's also incredibly strategically stupid because the people coming through that door are the people who, in the end, decide about your future. If you demonstrate your impartiality by committing to a programme as serious as that with a person like Andrew Neil presenting it, then you make your case without having to do any public affairs. You do it through the work. And that was squandered. So that's for others to sort of answer for, but that's where we ended up. My sense from the book and, and from what I see in watching the sort of the current affairs programmes, it's, it's ever more difficult to get them, as you say, to come on these programmes, do these set piece interviews, or at least do them for any great length of time mm-hmm. if they do appear on some of these shows. Is it that the media landscape has changed so much? They've got they've got other options. You know, they can do their sort of direct social media, direct TikTok video. They can do their interviews on YouTube, and they don't have to go through you guys anymore. I mean, or is a it... soft, friendly podcast. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to think that we're not that soft. Aren't we? <laughs> They're the worst um, podcast. <laughs> yeah. Or is it that? Actually, the politicians have also changed because, you know, my sense is that some of our politicians today, they sort of come out with these big, bold statements about who they are and what they believe in. But when you start to chip away, Mm. there's not the deep level of detail. There's not the level of engagement on the issues and the sort of the principles and their ability to apply those to public policy in the way that you had with people like Margaret Thatcher. Now, I'm not one of those who's a sort of golden ageist who mm-hmm. thinks it was all better 40 years ago. Mm-hmm. Absolutely not. Mm-hmm. But it does feel a bit like the politicians are not quite of the same calibre that they used to be. That would suggest that them not being of the same calibre would present, prevent them from doing programmes. But I think that would suggest a level of self-awareness that might not actually be there. <laughs> because I think that actually, in, in reality, politicians do want to be on television. And now, and I know that they can do their social media thing, which is, you know, largely preaching to the converted people who are following them. You know, that may, that's useful to them. I suppose it's an unmediated opportunity to get a message across. But look, it's still the case that TV and radio reach a lot of people in terms of numbers. They reach influential people. 
And if you are a politician who maybe not of a great high caliber, but believes they should be in the cabinet still, despite that, then I think they'd be attracted to doing doing those programs. But the, in the end, you know, there's a million reasons why we can argue ourselves out of saying that we should be doing something that's really vital for for the democratic debate. But I'm just, I'm, I suppose I'm just not doing that because I think I think it, there is a place for it. It's really important. And I think, we, you know, the way politics has been in, in recent years and the way people feel about it, the frustrations people feel, it's, it's an element that's gone for reasons I don't understand that don't make any sense to me. And, and it should be something that, that, you know, Sky News do it. I work at Sky um, with Beth Rigby. We, we do long interviews when we, can, when we can get them. And I think there's another thing, by the way, about that is we're not in an age anymore where we have to think about slots in quite the same way as we, we used mm. to. You know, it has to go out on a particular day at a particular time. It can be that if, if a significant interview is landed, it can be recorded and disseminated in all of its different ways. Incidentally, by the way, people talk about social media almost as if there's an argument against long form because social media demands short form. In fact, what happens is that long form delivers better short form. Because the nature of the conversation is so much deeper, you may get to a point which is not just a sort of moment of, like I say, of pyrotechnics, but it's actually a moment of either revelation like, Boris Johnson doesn't know what 5C is or just is something more interesting about, you know, policy. And so, you know, I think there's opportunities there which are sort of they're not in opposition with each other. But yeah, I mean, you, you might well be right that people might some might be reluctant. I mean, I talk about the Sunday policies. We did I, for a joke kind of thing. I call the chapter. If you build it, they won't come because you know, to some extent it was a struggle. But we did get people and we did an important job. Now, we may need that kind of scrutiny more than ever in the coming months because we're in the run up to a general election. Give us a picture from your experience of what you think is probably going on here. The broadcasters all trying to get debates between the potential prime ministers, the broadcasters trying perhaps to line up individual in-depth interviews with their crack interviewers Mm -hmm. with all the, the key players in the next election. How do you think that's going at the moment? Do you think the parties are, are trying very hard to game the system so that they don't do the awkward bits, that they just get the, the, the glory moments? Well, it's a good question. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know, but I do think we have to see... The unfortunate truth is we have to see that conversation in the context of the Andrew Neil interview that didn't happen in 2019. Because, as I say, a, a sort of norm was broken then. Because previously, they, what, so what happens is... There's a whole package that comes together at the beginning of the campaign. So, so they, the BBC might say, so we want we want debates. Then there's different configurations of that in terms of you might have head to head with the two main parties, or you might have the, the 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 larger cast. The BBC might say we want to do a question time special, which is a kind of hybrid idea of the interview and the and the panel. And then as part of the package, we want to do an interview with say Nick Robinson or Michelle Hussein or whoever it might be uh, on television, which will run in prime time. So there should be an agreement about that package. But as I've been outlined, we had a, a situation last time where that was broken the, the, on the part of the politician. They didn't honour that commitment. I say that on the assumption that they gave that commitment. So in other words, it's a whole package. And the question will be whether they seek to avoid signing up to a package at the outset and just try and pick and choose the bits and pieces that they want. And, and I don't know how that plays out because the things, you know, the BBC, for example, or Sky or, or ITV, they always used to connect the things. So you do this and you do this because then we'll get the broad range of you know, audience show, debate, forensic interview, whatever. So if the parties go in with a different approach, then it's it's hard to see how they kind of how that can be resolved without a return to that norm, which is that in the end we'll all do something reasonable. Do the broadcasters put their heads together and try and coordinate their efforts, or do you have several different broadcasters all engaged in separate negotiations with several different parties? My understanding is that, because uh, I didn't, wasn't involved in the debates, I think the debates there would be more of that kind of collaboration. I don't think on the precise nature of the other things they would necessarily do that. There's competition. The BBC would, or Sky or ITV would want to have their, the best possible package of things they can offer. So my conversations tend to be directly with the, the parties as we were underway after that agreement had been reached, rather than me, I wasn't actually brokering the agreement. So, mm-hmm. But I, I just wonder whether we are possibly heading towards a situation in the 2024 general election, which we assume is going to happen, that maybe the parties don't play that game anymore, yeah. don't actually submit to forensic interviews, maybe don't have leaders' debates either, and it's all them managing their own media and yeah. talking directly to the public with the broadcaster's sideline. Well, I, there, was some, there was some stories in recent months about the suggestion that the Labour might, that Starmer might not want to do it, which he then denied quite clearly that he was going to do it. So I think, you know, ultimately, does someone feel they've got too much to lose to do a debate? But I feel like the debates are sort of established, but the debates don't deliver very much for me. I mean, mm-hmm. it's a personal taste. I mean, uh, you know, so people, other people like that format, you know, because of the dynamics of it. And I can see when, when there are moments that are kind of 
memorable, although I was at the BBC's last one between Corbyn and Johnson, I can't remember anything about it. You I were actually there. in the room. I was in the room and it was there. there. And it just for me, it, it was just a repetition of lines that we'd heard a million times. Well, it's basically Prime Minister's Question Time in the studio. Yeah, no, uh, right. And, and no more edifying for that. But that doesn't mean that, I'd, look, I'm not saying they're not a good thing, because I think actually it's good that they exist uh, and, and, and that they can deliver moments that are, are valuable. But for me, I'm a bit obsessed by it, but the, the forensic long form interview is the best way of doing that. And it should be something that's linked to the package of including the debate. Uh, but it seems to me that that's almost the least likely bit to occur now. Perhaps. I mean, look, like I say, Boris Johnson's broken some norms of breaking news, right? So so those norms were broken in 2019. No longer can the broadcaster say, going back decades, this has always happened. Rishi Sunak and uh, Keir Starmer are very different characters to Boris Johnson, but they may not want to do these interviews. So how do the broadcasters possibly approach it differently this year for the general election then if you want to try and get them to do that long form interview accepting that the norm has been broken and Mm. and they can talk they can they can speak to a precedent and say well you know boris johnson didn't do it we're not going to do it but if one of them says yes how do you ensure that you don't end up in a situation again where the first player says yes and that's broadcast and then the second player goes "Mm, well perhaps i won't do that after all and you know the the there's an there's an imbalance again in in coverage i think that's exactly the right question because the, that process was not sort of the light wasn't shone on it before the the the, the, the johnson no show so now there may well be a stipulation that says we need to have the dates laid out and everyone agreed to them before we proceed with anything what that does is it hands it to the if anyone doesn't want to do it if one of the two major the two principal parties that's their opportunity to not do it and not get the blame yeah. Because they can say, well, you know, I can't do it that. I can't tell you yet. And, you know, the logistics of the campaign, we ha- it only ever worked because it was fluid. You did it when you could. But in the end, everyone did it because they thought it was the right thing to do. Or you, you get the first one, you, you record it, you get it in the can, but you don't broadcast it until the second one's in the can as well. Yeah, but, you know, as you know, I mean, election campaigns are very, very fluid things. So you, something, you hold something back for seven days. It just becomes... It, it, you know, it's old and rotten. Stale. Yeah. yeah. Is there any merit in trying to do this in a, in a more formal, structured way, that there's some kind of debate commission well, that, yeah. in advance, that the parties are all signed up in principle, we will do this, we will do a major interview, we will yeah, we will do the package you talked about? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I make that case in the book, and, and Andrew Neil actually uh, um, signs up to it. Robbie Gibb doesn't think they should be, so we had that interesting uh, dynamic there. I asked him because... Uh, Former uh, BBC political uh, programmes editor himself. Well, it's the same from, job I did, yeah. 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 And who, who, he's now at the BBC? He's on the yeah. board. He's yeah. on he's on the board at the BBC, having in the intervening period worked for Theresa May as her comms director. So. I, just, I just mentioned that he you know, he obviously is someone with both broadcast and political advisor or senior sort of advisor experience, and he, he would be opposed to... Uh, I think there would be a lot of people who'd be opposed to this idea there should be any any kind of stipulations by some kind of body to say what kind of things should happen. He thinks it should be a free market of idea. You know, I'm offering this opportunity. Do you want to do it? And they say yes. And the other one says no. And, and, and you win or you lose based upon what you're offering. Others, and I've been with them, including Andrew Neil, who's, so it's not really a left-right thing, you know, have, are more sympathetic to the idea of something a bit like what they have in the States, which would be, here's what we expect as, as a society on the media side when an election comes. That might be a good idea. I should perhaps declare an interest here because um, the Hansar Society, many years ago now, my one of my uh, former colleagues, Stephen Coleman, came up with a sort of first set of ideas for rules for, oh, for right. party leaders' debates. And we have, at the Society, been periodically approached by broadcasters about possibly playing the role that's taken by the sort of the League of Women Voters in the United mm. States in their debates commission about mm. whether we as a recognised impartial body that works on Parliament might uh, might perform that that role. We've obviously, it's, it's a fraught, <laughs> I think yeah. it's fair to say, and it's it's never gone anywhere. But isn't part of the problem that everybody's agreed that the principle of, of having the long-form interviews and the debates is important, it's important for scrutiny, it's important for you know our democracy, but in the end, what, where it all falls down is that the broadcasters end up in a competition with each other, and um, they don't actually always work together to get the outcome. But I think that, that would, I wonder whether that, that's the only way to make that change would be to establish the kind of body that you mentioned. Without that, I don't think that'll happen. But you, you say that... Um, Everyone's agreed on the, the value of the long form. I don't think that's the case. I mean, if, if Richie Sunak and Keir Starmer and all the others would go on, uh, on the record and say, we are all absolutely believe that it's the right thing to do, 
that would make it more difficult for them to find a way of ducking it because they would have they would have said we think it's a really important part of that mix. The reality is that some of them will want to avoid it. So we're going backwards in that sense. A final thought then. Hopefully the next election will be dotted by law form interviews and leaders' debates and the yeah, voters more, will tune in yeah, and watch. All that stuff. How much difference do you think they actually make? Are these the moments that can make or break election campaigns, change the fates of parties, change who's prime minister? Well I think you know, I think I guess there's a, a more fundamental question there about why elections are won by whoever they're won by. These things take a long time. There are deep-seated reasons for that. And I wouldn't suggest that the absence or otherwise of a particular format you know, on a particular election would impact the result, because it, it, it depends. You know. But if it's a close election, as well as it might, it's just a, a grown-up way of doing things. And also, by the way, it's really important. Um, and this is in the context of a leadership election rather than um, a general election. But Liz Truss, what happened in the run-up to that election was that she did not submit herself to any long-form interviews apart from one, which didn't go so well with Nick Robinson on, on the radio floor. But she was making a big argument, she said, about the future. And she was akin, she maintained, to Margaret Thatcher in that sense. Someone who had big ideas, wanted to bring change, but she didn't want to go out and actually have it test. Unlike Margaret Thatcher, she, wouldn't, she didn't want to go into a situation where it was tested under scrutiny and people could then judge whether it was a sensible, risky... But she might have said, you know, this could hurt, it could go wrong for a bit, but it's the only way if we want to change things fundamentally come with me and here's why. Instead, she did the minimum amount. In other words, if you get to power having properly explained, having held yourself up to scrutiny, you have a more valuable mandate to do the things you're saying you want to do. So it's actually important for you. Politicians often ask, what's in it for me? Well, first of all, you get to run the country, so there, there's that. But secondly, it might help you run the country in the way you want to if you've gone out and made an argument and won an argument. If you don't argue and you don't, and you don't debate properly, then that won't happen. We can only hope the next election works that way. Uh, Rob Belly, thanks for joining us on the pod. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Well, that's all from us for this week's episode of Parliament Matters. Please hit the follow or subscribe button in your podcast app to get the next episode as soon as it lands. And help us to make the podcast better by leaving a rating or review on Apple or Spotify and sharing your feedback. Our producer tells us it's important for the algorithm to give the show a boost. And Mark, tell us more about the algorithm. Well, what do I know about algorithms? You know, I write my scripts with a quill pen on vellum and then send it in by carrier pigeon. <laughs> Well, before we go, a quick reminder also that you can send us your questions on all things Parliament by visiting hansardsociety.org.uk slash PMEUQ. We'll be discussing them in future episodes, including our special Urgent Questions editions dedicated to what you want to know about Parliament. And you can find us across social media at Hansard Society to get more content related to the show and the wider work of the Hansard Society. Parliament Matters is produced by the Hansard Society and supported by the Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust. For more information, visit hansardsociety.org.uk slash PM or find us on social media at Hansard Society. Yeah.